There we go. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to step away from, I guess, Tamriel and never played Elder Scrolls. I'm sorry. I'm going to go into my uh, nerd phase of uh, playing Legend of Zelda for decades. So if anyone doesn't know, Legend of Zelda is a saga of video games developed mainly by Nintendo from the 1980s until today. Um, and there have been 19 major Zelda games throughout these decades, with the 20th forthcoming next year, hopefully. Uh, and The Legend of Zelda has some unique characteristics, because unlike other sagas of Zelda Scrolls, and most games feature the same characters over and over. The titular Princess Zelda, the evil Ganon, the protagonist Link. Um, also, from those 19 games, 14 take place in the same territory, the Kingdom of Hyrule. And interestingly enough, those adventures that take place in other lands are supposed to are interpreted by the community as hallucinations, the afterlife, and other sort of fantasy worlds within that fantasy, let's say. So um, basically, um, the Kingdom of Hyrule is the, the main set of the game, not only of the adventure, but also basically most of the MacGuffins and stuff that the player engages with is rooted in the land. So things like the Triforce sort of explain why the land exists, but also uh, the the ideology behind the political um, rule that is in a kingdom, obviously, that lasts for millennia, which normally doesn't happen if we know us uh, from history. Uh, however, I, yeah, I want to focus on the um, Kingdom of Hyrule because even though the characters are reiterative, basically, they are quite devoid of personality in a very purposeful way. For example, Link uh, is sort of supposed to be a blank slate for the player to sort of insert himself and experience the land through this avatar, basically, even though the avatar has changed from 8-bit to 3D to more cartoon cartoonish, etc. Uh, so the different maps in the games that we experience are also understood to be the same. Not uh, It's not like in Elder Scrolls that you're experiencing different areas of a land, a continent, whatever, you're experiencing the whole world that exists. However, they are not coherent. So this is Hyrule, and this is Hyrule, and this is Hyrule. Uh, the central premise of the games is that the main heroes, Link and Zelda, are bound to reincarnate every time the, the villain reincarnates. So every time the world's in danger, there's a reincarnation and a version of Link or the princess to come and save the day, basically. So the saga itself is based on repetition of characters, of tropes, and even the tools that the hero can use. But because of both the deep history of the kingdom and because you cannot sell the same game over and over and expect people to buy it, it is based on repetitive difference, basically. Uh, so these are not simply different iterations in the way that you may get different uh, worlds in a Mario game, for example, where Mario just pops up in different worlds. These are understood to be the uh, different moments in the history of the same land. So the, uh, the understanding is that the player is following the history of the land through the history of the games. Um, wait. There we go. This is not only done through referencing the same kingdom, but also through including in the map many elements that are repeated throughout uh, the game. So, for example, the central castle, uh, regions such as Lake Hylia, uh, the Lost Woods or Death Mountain do not appear in every game, but here in most games. So here, here we have Lake Hylia, the Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess, Breath of the Wild, and uh, A Link to the Past. So games may also reference two events that happen in other games in, in the timeline and every sort of, it was trying to connect to it, the own history that you would have played in other games. So the idea is that these games were connected, sort of already was leading fans to speculate on which game fell where, how, we, how can we place them in a timeline. Uh, but for many years, this was just led to speculation until in, Nintendo was sort of bullied into creating, into publishing an official timeline. Uh, they mentioned they had like a confidential document, but basically it seems that they were just forced to, to publish it because of the, the uh, fan insistence, basically. This timeline is not a straight one. It's subdivided into three parallel timelines because one game involves time travel. And obviously that, as we all know, creates <laughs> different parallel timelines, yada, yada. So the interesting aspect of this timeline is also that it's not linear. It brings together two times that do not coincide. So on the one hand, the real world timeline of when these games were developed in the 80s, the 90s, which consoles were they allowed to play with? And in the other uh, area, the in-world timeline of 
events that took place in Hyrule 10,000 years ago or uh, more recently in the timeline. So um, these do not correlate because some games were designed as sequels, others were designed as prequels, others were inserted randomly. I have not included all games in the timeline because I've only included the ones that take place in the land of Hyrule here, in case someone, because I know that some people are very obtuse about them. <laughs> The timeline. Also, for example, even though they have updated the, the timeline, this one is just the, what fans have sort of agreed upon. Because, for example, Breath of the Wild, which is the last game, has been sort of placed by the fans, but Nintendo has left it very ambiguous because, as I will ex explore now, basically, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so, by creating an official timeline, the developers have coded all iterations of the game into a, we would presume, a coherent narrative. Yet the map is con continuously reimagined and reiterated. The kingdom has been underwater, it has been raised to the skies, it has been even covered by train tracks, which does not make sense in a fa medieval fantasy, let's say. Yet, in each map, there are certain constants, elements that tell a player that this is undoubtedly the kingdom of Hyrule. I thought, aside from this, the maps are filled with references and nods to other areas from other games in, in, the, in the real world past. Sometimes these are models of buildings that are taken directly from one game, other they're just small nods and references for the super fans. So here we have Spectacle Rock in the first Zelda game, and then in A Link to the Past, which were, uh, this area was placed in Death Mountain, which is in the northwest of the map, and then all of a sudden this same area was moved to the other corner of the map to the, what's normally a desert, basically. So what we see is that these references and nods are not aimed to have a, an coherence with the what we would assume would be a physical development of the kingdom, but it's more to play with fans and to play with the community. So, uh, <coughs> so we have these nods moving areas and entire regions sometimes from, from side to side. Sorry about the voices. The party was last night. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so, however, the chronology attempts to continuously code these incoherences and quite literally map them and place them on a virtual surface. And here I'm using virtual in the sense that everyone understands it, not in the Deleuzean sense, I'm really sorry. Uh, but it is in this interaction between the attempt at coding and these fluctuations of the map and the seemingly chaotic nods and references that the place for a creative world building emerges. Uh, a white community of Zelda fans has tried to explain how features of the terrain can sometimes change, can sometimes move, how can there be a reference to a race of people that never existed in any previous games, how can it be that evolution affects different people at different rates, and so basically <laughs> how can we make sense of what happened uh, in a non-linear chronology in a linear way. Basically. So as an example, in the second Zelda game, and originally named Zelda 2, um, there were a series of towns that the player could explore. Uh, these towns have not appeared in any other game, before or after, uh, but basically, normally the realm only has two towns and they're quite small and all that. However, um, these names were then added as a reference in a later game, in Ocarina of Time, uh, to reference these uh, sages, basically, which are sort of... Um, powerful figures that are related to protecting the kingdom. So um, these were just included as th the names of the, of the sages referencing these towns were probably just a nod to a game that, to be honest, was not that popular, not that many pe uh, people played. However, 20 years later, we find that the community is trying to create theories of how this would make sense, and sometimes even drawing from uh, theories that are very laden with anthropology. So, for example, they would say that this, these sages would become the ancestral figures of certain tribes that would settle the land in very similar way to what we find, for example, in, in early medieval Spain, where we have towns that are named from the children of this tribe uh, and giving the, the tribal ancestry the name of the town that they will become a sense of place. So we have that the community is um, sort of brought to engage with the world in meaningful ways and often um, in creative ways from theories that maybe they're not fam that familiarized with. Uh, so virtual communities emerge then on the real world in forums, wikis, Reddit communities, or entire YouTube channels dedicated to theorizing about uh, the world of Zelda and the history of the world that it presents. These theories are in a way performative. They know that they are just putting a tinfoil hat and basically trying to make sense of what are just design choices happening 
throughout a very complex process of creating a video game. However, uh, they are still uh, creating debate and engagement in sort of like a modern version of myth building and world creation in a modern version of uh, gathering around a bonfire, even though it's on Reddit, so it's not so healthy. Uh, similar to how cosmologies in, for example, medieval Britain would try to make sense of the history of the territory by merging the physical evidence with oral histories, folk tales, the Christian beliefs, um, to build the world around them, to create a sense of world building. So here we have Merlin, as we all know, build Stonehenge, obviously, uh, because uh, they try to make sense of the past lives of the world in the modern, cosmolo modern to the day uh, cosmologies that they had, the contemporary cosmologies. Uh, so as archaeologists, we need to engage not solely with coherent timelines of events as we are studying history, but we also try to uh, align with these manifestations of world building as we try to situate ourselves in each iteration of the game or in the period or area that we are studying. So on the, on the other hand, this timeline is not at all regular. The distance between the games and the timeline is sometimes a few years, sometimes a few generations, sometimes millennia have passed. And these create different folds in, in the terrain in which the placement of, of these nods to the super fans um, <coughs> warp how materials or cultures relate to the territory. So some races evolved from fish-like fish -like creatures to bird-like creatures in a hundred years. And then we have structures that uh, are made of wood and stone that survived 10,000 years seemingly unchanged because they are a reference uh, for the super fans to sort of be like, oh, I play that. Um, so basically, uh, then we have that materiality be behaves differently in these incoherences and they're made sense of in different ways. Time and place come together and it is in their relation that the world of Hyrule, this mythical millenary kingdom, emerges. Yet this world is then read and made sense by the community that inhabits it, which is not really the virtual beings that live in these games, but the community of gamers and fans. The community attempts to make, again, a linear sense of a non-linear time. Uh, so here we have another, actually, another dungeon that in 10,000 years was covered by sand and turned into a ruin. Uh, this has been brought even for, further, not solely by social media and new ways of interconnectivity in these communities, but also through the last game of the franchise to have come out, Breath of the Wild. So whilst in other Zelda games, the history of the territory is sort of normally contained to the dungeons, which are in themselves, you're entering into the path, you're entering into an old temple or ruin, and to discuss, to retrieve an item that you're going to use in the adventure. Uh, the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild brought the, the ruins and the history of the world to the surface, basically. And here it was not forced upon the player to do these tasks to beat the game, but sort of to engage with the territory to explore how how they wanted to either go directly to the final boss and skip most of the game or just try to explore and enjoy the, the, the view, basically. So it changed the relationship between the physical world and the player entirely. I want to bring a last example precisely from this game. So the map of, the, of Breath of the Wild falls under an open world and was inspired by maps of games that came before, mainly uh, Twilight Princess and Ocarina of Time. So both, uh, both are placed chronologically in this timeline before the game. Uh, Breath of the Wild mimics the distribution of areas generally and even this place uh, in the starting area, basically a clone of a very emblematic location from Ocarina of Time, which is the Temple of Time. So uh, actually some players have mapped the, the ruins around and what would have been around the Temple of Time and Ocarina of Time, and apparently they match perfectly. However, things around that area, for example, do not match, even though there are general, general um, parallels. So for example, we have Death Mountain, Death Mountain, like in the north, uh, northeast, northeast. We have the castle in the center, castle in the center. We have the lake in the south, the lake in the south. However, the Temple of Time itself moved location, apparently. So instead of being uh, here, where it should have been, maybe, it was located here. So then that led to people theorizing that maybe it was moved by divine intervention or whatnot. Uh, uh, basically, <clears throat> finding creative ways of forcing sense into this with theories such as the Great Swap, in which, yeah, two, uh, the gods would have moved. Obviously, it's magical and they're, they're divine intervention. So uh, making sense within the logic of the game of this change of the terrain, basically. <clears throat>
Uh, this, of course, are mythologies created by the players, as a, which act as another agent in regulating the flows of this terrain. However, we know that many of these inconsistencies are precisely the result of the design of the game. In the case of the previous example, it's just that at a certain stage of the game development, they might have decided that the starting area didn't fit being in the north, and it fitted better being in the south for you as a player to engage with the world, basically, rather than an internal trying to trying to make an internal uh, sense of cohesion in the timeline. So what emerges is a landscape where time, place, official, and folk narratives all grow and are entwined together. The world itself grows from very material aspects, such as the console itself and what it can it support. Earlier games could not support very large maps, nor, nor very detailed, so with time, the map has quite literally unfolded from a number of pixels to a virtual surface of 360 kilometer squares from 2D, an isometric view, into 360 and, uh, and 3D. Yet as the map is always displaying the same region, there's always a sense of continuity, of a layered terrain. The pixels and polygons that configure this virtual geography quite literally vibrate in many ways, in the sense of Bennett's vibrancy. For instance, materials such as rocks are incorporated into the adventure, and depending on the game, a player can move them to reveal a dungeon, bomb them to uncover a treasure chest, or they can hurl them and use them as a weapon to attack an enemy. Uh, also, they, but also they grow. So Death Mountain consisted of a series of plateaus, I don't think a thousand, uh, on its first appearance on an 8-bit map, whilst in its later iterations it's a series of slopes, plateaus, lava fields, with a maximum height of 1,012 meters above sea level in the game. So all these are, are different iterations of the same virtual geography. However, the history presented by Nintendo in official publications attempts to code them into a timeline to unify all these different forces into a, into a law. Let's say like a mobile machine, the timeline gives order to these uh, different uh, iterations of, of, of the same land. However, this timeline is not a mere imposition. It grows from the land itself as well. As a new game is designed, the creative team may have an idea to make the world open or to make the adventure center around sailing or flying uh, or to use certain controls that the new con console offers. And this molds the iteration of the Kingdom of Hyrule that the player is going to encounter. <coughs> the story itself is also not created in a vacuum because it has to grow from this reiterative characters that we have, so from Zelda, from Link, from the Triforce, from what have you. Elements of a common pantheon that is constantly being reborn and rearranged. Uh, there we go. <laughs> the attempt to fold these uh, layers into a coherent timeline leaves crevices, uh, as these are irregular, and leaves irregular folds. It also leaves for a uh, way for incoherences in the narrative. This happens first through the characters in the world that live in the presence of their own past, which is not necessarily coherent to the past presented in other iterations of the game. It also happens in references to other games or characters, and the design choices from the architects of these narratives, or the team at Nintendo. Uh, <clears throat> the design team can move or transform an area to suit the story that they want to create. They, they attach the story to the land itself, yet in constantly changing it, they create gaps in the same way that uh, the use of cars change our relationship to the landscape as distances sort of uh, folded back. A new understanding of the geography in an open world game creates new attachments to the geography, one in which narratives are, by their very nature, incoherent. And lastly, we have the community of fans who act like archaeologists, try to understand where these ruins come from, how to make sense of the different temporalities we have experienced as players immersed in these games. So Hyrule is constantly being remade. Uh, <clears throat> this is the value of these incoherences themselves, as they are where the community lodges itself, where they find the space for their own creation through theories or versions that the history uh, of the history that add to the common lore. These are almost like folk tales, where elements that may be present in the official pantheon or the mythology can be reworked to integrate and, and to create these theories, which then hold great popularity and are subject to continuous debate and discussion. It's almost like they make their own internal memes in, those, in these communities. Some of them are then picked up by the team at Nintendo and maybe referenced in a later game uh, and what have you. So these theories also stem from an attachment to the landscape itself and its history and often make way for their own incoherences. So the theory of the, of the big swap 
explains why the Lost Woods has changed its position in the map, yet it does not not explain how the Zora River also changed location or how uh, basically the race of fish-like creatures that evolved into bird-like creatures are now represented twice because you have both the fish-like creatures and the bird-like creatures in the same map and what's, what's happening there, basically. So uh, <laughs> this is also constantly occurring in the real world. Attachments to the landscape incorporate elements from previous cosmologies and worldviews. Earlier versions of myths or a new settlement or an old ruin that has collapsed, a landslide that has buried an old house, the arrival of new people or new technologies. All these are elements that as archaeologists, we need to bring together when addressing attachment to place in any particular time. <coughs> By lodging ourselves in that same time fall, basically. It is in the interrelation between the physicality of the world and its change through time with different utterances of a lived space, different relations to the land, that the world and the landscape itself are reiterated. Uh, they are repeated anew, but they are forever changed and incoherent. 